we are live. Welcome everyone. We are just gonna give folks a few moments to log in. We have a large crowd today, so uh, we want to bar any technical difficulties. So just hold tight and we will begin in a moment. And um, so we already have a, a chat question. There is no video for the participants. That's correct. We're expecting uh, close to 400 people today. So we would have a lot of screens going. Looks like Bruce Thayer is uh, showing some love for our panelists, telling y'all what a great group it is. And yes, I believe, I do not believe that um, in this platform, uh, uh, non-panelists have the ability to communicate outside of the chat or the question and answer. So we are very fortunate to um, have uh, Arathi uh, Maleku who will be moderating the chat and the question and answer for us. We still have people coming in, so I'm going to give it a few more seconds because, you know, academics, we're running from one meeting to the next. So, uh, Okay, as people trickle in, we're at about 200 folks right now. A few reminders. First of all, welcome. This is a webinar hosted by the Society for Social Work and Research, um, specifically hosted by the Research Capacity and Development Committee. Um, and this webinar is entirely dedicated uh, to the discussion of how one would approach the trajectory for promotion to full professor. Uh, so welcome today. Some housekeeping. If you have questions, the best way to ask those questions is either in the Q&A, which is actually the best. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A tab um, because it's kind of, it's a more stable um, um, place. Uh, the chat, sometimes it'll scroll past us, but you can also use the chat if that is easier. Um, we won't be able to hear your voices. So raising your hand, unfortunately, doesn't work in, the, in this platform. Um, I am Dorian Traub. I am an associate professor at the University of Southern California, Suzanne Dvorak Peck School of Social Work. Um, I have also served as the associate dean for faculty affairs and interim vice dean of the school. Uh, I also, before we begin, want to thank the Society for Social Work and Research for hosting this. 
um, and The Ohio State University for allowing us to use their webinar platform. Uh, and then finally, um, members of the RCDC committee who were very helpful with all of this, especially this webinar planning committee that included our chair, Jennifer Bellamy from the University of Denver and um, Arate Maleku from the Ohio State University who is here moderating our chat for us. Henrika McCoy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Camille Quinn also from the Ohio State University and Anamika Adhikari from the University of Denver. I will tell you, if you have the opportunity to work with any of these women, you will be better off for it. So take that opportunity. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce our panelists. We are so excited to have this group. When we put this panel together, we wanted to be really thoughtful about representing various places in a career trajectory. So people who were newly promoted, people who had been a full professor for a longer period of time, people who have served on promotion committees at a university level or a school level. And I think we have a fantastic group of folks to field your questions today. First, we have Dawn Anderson Butcher. She's a professor of social work at The Ohio State University and a licensed independent social worker in the state of Ohio. She holds a courtesy appointment in physical activity and educational services in Ohio State's College of Education and Human Ecology. Additionally, she chairs the National Mental Health Education Integration Council, a network of interdisciplinary scholars, practitioners, policymakers, and graduate students focused on workforce preparation and school mental health. Welcome, Don. We have John Clapp, who is a professor in the Suzanne Dvorak Peck School of Social Work at the University of Southern California. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Health Behavior and the American Academy of Social Work and Welfare. He is currently the Associate Dean for Research at USC, but has also served as Executive Vice Dean and Dean previously. He um, also was served as Associate Dean for Research at the um, College of Social Work at The Ohio State University. We have Patrick Leung, who is a professor and Gerson and Sabina David Endowed Professor of Global Aging, Director of the Office of International Social Work Education at the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work. He has served on the University Promotion and Tenure Advisory Committee for 12 years. And he was on the board of the Council on Social Work Education from 2003 to 2006 and served on the Commission for Diversity and Social Economic Justice Council on Social Work Education from 2007 to 2010. Next, we have Trina Shanks. She is the Harold R. Johnson Collegiate Professor of Social Work, Director of Community Engagement, Director of the Center for Equitable Family and Community Wellbeing and Family Faculty Associate, the Survey Research Institute and the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. From 2010 to 2012, she was appointed by Michigan Governor Granholm to serve two years in the State Commission on Community Action and Economic Opportunity. She is currently one of the National Network co-leads for the Social Work Grand Challenge on reversing extreme economic inequality and a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute. And last but certainly not least, we have Daryl Wheeler, who is a provost and senior vice president for academic affairs at Iona College. Previously, he was the Dean of the School of Social Welfare and Vice President for Public Engagement at the University at Albany, SUNY. He was Dean of the School of Social Work at Loyola University, Chicago, and he has held academic positions at Hunter College, Columbia University, and the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. I also want to note that we were supposed to be joined today by Beverly Arahu Dawson. Um, you may have seen that on the advertisements. Unfortunately, she is feeling ill today and unable to join us and we wish her a speedy recovery. Welcome everyone. So let me begin by kicking this off to our panel. You can see my, my um, trusty loyal companion here in the background. Uh, we received a lot of questions, both internally from our SWER board, but also from folks who had registered about various challenges that have kind of historically existed around going up for full, but also unique challenges related to the current COVID pandemic. Um, 
And so I think the first way to open this up might be a, a broad question about what do the pathways of going up for full look like? Are there options beyond just scholarship? Especially because some people are at schools that have more of a teaching or service emphasis and what that would look like. Patrick, can we start with you? Sure. Uh, I'm Patrick Lang from the University of Houston. Uh, I think um, the person coming up for uh, promotion or tenure or full professor may uh, be well prepared. Uh, preparation is not just scholarship, but it also pre preparing yourself to find for arms link reviewers. Now, it's very difficult. Arms link reviewers are those uh, colleagues, they probably have not collaborated with you, working with you together, or supervise you for your dissertation, etc. So essentially, uh, it's a very important piece because in my experiences uh, for the last 12 years, when we look at people who are not arm's length, um, the latter is less important from them compared to others. Uh, I also want to emphasize is that um, I am very curious if I were to come up for a full professor, how many people citing me in the history? And what's my age index? What, how many uh, impact factor journals that I have published? What is my, um, uh, what's my uh, age score, okay? Or G uh, uh, index score. That uh, is very important in my opinion. So that's a brief uh, kind of a summary. Excellent, thank you. Trina, do you have a, oh, I'm sorry. Let me go to Trina and then I'll go to Daryl. Um, Trina, do you have a different uh, uh, or similar opinion about? Well, obviously um, having arms link with you is important and have citations um, is important. Um, on this question about if it is only scholarship, I would say that um, it would be really important for the thing that aren't scholarship to be complementary to your scholarships. So rather than just saying, I stopped doing scholarship to be a dean, or, or not to be a dean, but to, to do this um, service um, role or to take this um, leading the MSW program and I just didn't publish for 10 years. That's not good enough. You have to kind of show that if you're not um, having as much scholarship, how is what you're doing in the community? How is what you're doing in your service role? How you're doing in the academy or with um, national organizations um, relevant to your scholarship? And so maybe um, if you are having, you still have to have some publications, of course, but if you have fewer publications, you can show that all this work you've done at this national board, or all this work that you've done in your local community, all this work you've done um, at your university or supporting other junior faculty or other people coming up, how those things are related to your overall academic portfolio. And if you can make those cases, you can say kind of like, well, I helped launch the careers of three doctoral students and one junior faculty, and we've co-written some things together. So it doesn't look like I've done as much, but that's kind of part of my repertoire because it's what I was doing in service, but also related to scholarship. The reason I was asked to be on this national board and I can lead all this work is because I'm a known figure in child welfare or in you know international social work or something like that. So, so you have to really tell the story about not just by scholarship, but how all those other things you do are related to your scholarship. And then that kind of gives a more complete picture. That's helpful. Very helpful. And Daryl, and then I'll come to you, John. Certainly. Um, I would agree with particularly what I heard from Trina. I would just add that the context of the institution is critical. There are various types of academic institutions. So understanding what your institution both values and what they need. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm coming up for promotion, as I'm coming up for tenure, I want to understand how this fits with the strategic agenda for this institution over the next five to 10 years, because the attribution of tenure or promotion to full is a both a financial and a political commitment on the part of the institution to keeping you around for a period of time. And so they need to, in the reviewer's eyes, see the merit. And so as a provost, and I've served as the provost here and as an interim provost at R1, it's crucial when I'm reviewing credentials for me to understand how I'm receiving a recommendation 
from the tenure and review body because they are truly recommending to the provost. Once that recommendation is received, it's incumbent upon me to translate that into institutional value for the next five to 40 years, depending on what it is. And so I would really emphasize that the pathways are contextual, but I do so agree with the comments about, um, um, Patrick, your comments about scholarship and Trina's. The scholarship is crucial and, and I really emphasize that in social work, it is imperative upon us, I think even more now than in historical times, to be able to articulate the value added of having social workers in the mix. Because when you're in a complex organization like a research one institution, you're competing with those from other disciplines. And so my research in HIV and working with a lot of bench and biomedical and medical providers, I compete with them a lot and I've learned tremendously from them about how to frame the value added of the impacts of the work that I do. And I think this relates to being able to talk about how it influences pedagogy, how it transforms the nature of social work practice and how ultimately it transforms the lives and circumstances of the recipients. Thank you. And John, and, and John, while you're sharing your um, comment, we also had a Q&A that dovetails from this that I am hoping you can also field, which is what do you do if you have a very good scholarly profile, but less community impact or university leadership? Okay, yeah, I'll, so I'll try to give both a, both a whirl. Uh, first, I'd like to agree with, with all the, the previous comments. I want to come back to this idea of of telling the story in your statement, because I think this is critical. Um, having both been a full professor at three different universities and reviewed tons of external uh, statements over the years, to the extent you can um, tell your story, both as Trina said, but also include what Daryl said, you have to also kind of, because what, what gets asked of you is, uh, or of your reviewers is, you know, would this person get tenure at your institution? But if they don't have a context for the institution you're at, it's very hard to evaluate it. So I think it's important as a candidate that you can build that in and say, well, you know, at, at this university, these are the types of things that are generally appreciated. And here's how I've accomplished those things. And so I, I just think that piece of, of tying everything you've done together and putting it in context for the reviewers is, is critical, especially the external people. But presumably the people at your own institution will, will know that, but that's not always the case either. Um, Dorian, what was the, the, the question again? How to navigate um, if you have a very robust scholarly profile, but but a smaller service profile, especially uh, related to school or university service. So, and I and I hope other panelists can can take a shot at this too. Uh, I think every place is different, right? And so, one of the the key things is to know the context of your own university and what's expected. Um, and the, the sooner you know that, the better. Um, so at some places they expect junior faculty, you know, from assistant to associate, it's just department level service. And then other places I've been, they expect at least one university level committee to get to full. Um, other places like USC expect a service on national organizations, right? So, um, so you know, it's important to go out and be on a SWER kind of committee or, or some other committee. So, so really talk to people, figure out what's expected at your own place early. And if you don't have it, you know, take the time to, to don't put yourself up too soon, right? There's you're going to full, you, you, you have the luxury of deciding when you go up. So make sure you get what you need and then go from there. Don, do you have anything you would add to that? Sure, John, I appreciated your comment about the context. I think that's really important um, in terms of the Carnegie classifications and sort of really understanding how your institution values the service, the teaching and the research. 
and knowing full well that you will need to have a trajectory and sort of a um, record of excellence across your scholarship over time. Um, but that as you move forward in your career, you'll be looking at, you know, um, excellence in teaching in mentoring doctoral students and having students go on to other academic institutions and, and continue in that line of inquiry. Uh, and then the service element, I think, is really um, pushed at, dependent on, the, car, on the, the type of institution you're at. So at a place like Ohio State, we're looking for national reputation, national leadership, perhaps even international. Uh, and, and part of what you want to do is look at your CV, look at your contributions over time and figure out where there's holes or gaps and how you get mentorship and support to be able to build the best case for you. Um, I think John's point too about you know slowing down and taking the time to, to put forth the best case is really important too. So sometimes folks will go up too early knowing that they don't have all the pieces in place uh, and then be disappointed afterwards. Um, so just, you know, get some mentorship, get some ideas about where you can improve and, and, then, and then move forward. So that- I want to interject a little oh, bit yes. is that, um, uh, I want to mention is that uh, the expectation in some university that one has to be well known both nationally or and internationally. So that will help you to be more uh, prepared uh, in terms of what board you want to serve, uh, what journal you want to serve, and then what activity you'll be engaging uh, so that you will become more nationally known uh, or internationally known. So that's the uh, 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 criteria in some university. You have to be have a significant contribution to the nation and the world globally. Thank you. Thank you. And we've been um, receiving some Q&A questions that also dovetail off of this about what do you do when there are gaps in your profile? Um, I, I understand many of you have urged people to try to round out their profile as much as possible. Uh, but sometimes folks have gaps due to life circumstances, which is particularly relevant right now with COVID, but also because they have taken on administrative duties for their university or their school and how to manage in, uh, um, that in your narrative. So uh, Trina, because you have a lot of those duties, would you mind uh, <laughs> taking that question first? Um, well, I will, even though I think there might be people more senior who can answer that than I, but I will just um, on this point of um, how to make sure you have that full rounded thing. One thing I did in particular, I just got um, full professor January, 2020. And so I really thought strategically about what to say yes to and what to say no to because I was doing a lot of community engagement things in Detroit, as Detroit was coming out of bankruptcy and doing all sorts of things, I got asked to be on all of these university committees related to Detroit. And so the first one I served on, because it was my first university committee, by the time I got the second or third one, I actually wrote to the provost and said, um, I really don't think I should do more of this. I'll just stay on the one that I'm on, but I don't need two or three more because I need to do more of these national things. And I decided to run for the SOAR board and, and, and was elected to treasurer. And I did that strategically. So since I already had a couple of key university ones, I wanted to get my national ones and wanted to solidify my community projects as opposed to taking on more of the same thing over and over again, just to, just to get back to that point of rounding off. And then, um, and, and trying to um, actually, actually asked to be on more review boards. So I didn't have as much national review boards at that time. And I was trying to get that national reputation. So just to kind of be strategic about what you say no or yes to, particularly the years leading up when you might be going up. Um, but then this idea about, about gaps. So, um, so one of the things for me that I tried to do is um, I, I tried to show that because I spent 10 years on a community-based project, um, the first four or five years, there weren't very many publications, but we had a big book at the end. So I emphasized the book. I emphasized that it took the 10 years to get all the work done to go into the book and said, um, yeah, um, I mean, I did have other secondary data analysis up to that point, but I made the case at the beginning of my statement, when you have a long-term project that's collaborative, that takes a lot of time to do, it takes a while for these products to come through. And so I set that context at the beginning, and then I really emphasized the book at the end. Like at the end, we had this kind of big product at the end. Um, and so, but if there's a gap because of, of, of service, um, again, the question is, can you tie that into something? So is there some writing you did around um, the teaching and service that you can point to and say that even though there's not as much, all this work that I did as head of the 
PhD program or head of MSW program or whatever it is, head of research, um, allowed me to do these really um, interesting pro products that I wouldn't ever do otherwise. So I think that idea of telling the story is still important. But other people who, who, who might have something to say about those gaps for administrative cleats of them. Sure, John, I saw you uh, had something to contribute. Yeah, I, just to that point, I think the um, the idea of being able to say you had an impact and where that impact occurred is is really powerful, right? So if you work with the community for 10 years on a project, that probably resulted in a community level impact that you can talk about. Universities love that, right? A lot, you know, it's, it's, it's a win-win and it shows, especially in an applied field like social work, that your scholarship is making it out of the journal and into the real world. I, you, know, you know, so you can do it at the community level. You can also do it in your own department. So when you get asked or tapped to, to take on some uh, crucial role as an administrator, um, talk about the impact it made on the department. What did you? What did that contribute to the school to move the whole school forward? Um, those those are ways to make a gap um, not a, a liability but an asset. Daryl, did you have something to say? Yes, happy to contribute to this discussion. I, I do agree that being able to make your make poly impacts out of singular efforts, meaning equifinality is what I'm after. If I can connect my service work to transformation of my institution or some significant problem, that makes a lot of difference. And like many social workers, and this is why I mentioned the context earlier, some of us who have built our careers off of um, anchoring to commu community have found that to be a scary transition at that initial tenure point, because we didn't just spend time churning out manuscripts, we really spent time trying to understand the people and the circumstances in which we work. Took away a lot of time compared to someone who might be um, working off of a fixed data set. So I think that's really profound information. I just want to say, because I did prime a question, I hope this doesn't take away, we were talking about an international reputation. I don't think that international reputation means that you have to do international work. I think international reputation means that you are recognized globally for the contributions that you make. So I saw a question that came up. I don't have to work, so if I can use my own situation, work on HIV because HIV was a global, is a global experience and working on underrepresented groups here, Black men who have sex with men in the United States afforded me a global platform because the consequences of this work were of interest to people around the globe. So I think one has to be able to frame it and not necessarily see that they have to go offshore <laughs> to make a global impact. And some of that is how you narrate that in relationship to the work that you're doing. Don, Yeah, I just want to add a caveat though, because when I do external reviews, um, you will see significant gaps, right? In maybe as people take on administrative roles or maybe they are um, involved in community-based projects or whatever. And, and I think it does interrupt the research trajectory over time. And what folks are looking for is productivity and cadence, right? That you're not gonna come in and out and you're not just doing this right now for full. And so I do think even as you engage in a broad community-based you know, project or you take on a um, director role of the DSW or the MSW program, it is really important to still contribute to the knowledge base um, in publications and scholarship. And I think sometimes people make the mistake and stop doing those things. And it indeed does hinder their ability to go up to promotion at a time when they might want to. So, so it is really important um, to think about these things, but remember you still have to kind of get some things out there, even in the lieu of these gaps um, in your, in your um, CV. So, because that's what people will look for right away is, is there a three, four or five year gap where nothing came out and now all of a sudden they've publish six things and they want to go up for promotion next year and it kind of puts up a red flag. So you need to really stay consistent 
It's okay to blip a little bit, but you also want to make sure you have some kind of you know, ceiling on, or floor effect on it, right? That shows your, your stability over time. Patrick. Um, I uh, just wanted to bring it up uh, on a issue during, uh, during the, uh, COVID-19. I have receiving so many requests for review articles. So I'm thinking about if you want to come up, there's a question about should I come up right now or not? So it depends. Uh, if so many uh, uh, submission for review, it become more competitive in terms of article being accepted by journals. So I don't know. But on the other hand is that um, I talked to my colleague yesterday. Um, she said, I have more time during the pandemic. So I submit more articles. And as a result, she said, uh, I asked how many articles did you get accepted last year or published? She said, I have 18 last year. So I said, wow, that's a lot um, in one year. So there's mixed uh, uh, feeling. One, on one hand, we have more time because I come to go to work every day, two hours. And then now I don't eat out, oh, I don't cook, okay? I cook at home. So I have actually four hours that I stay at home to work harder. And therefore we produce more articles and as a result become more submission and more competitive for review. On the other hand, I have more time and then therefore I hope I get more publications uh, accepted. So that is a dynamic I'm thinking. Uh, there's a question related to this is that um, in my institution, the question of why now must be addressed. Can you speak to different argument one can make to justify the promotion at this time? So it depends on your success, but it's very competitive right now in terms of review and acceptancy. So that is a good segue into a question um, that has shown up in our chat and also in our planning around the impact of COVID on people's trajectories. So there are people who have benefited, um, their, either their research was boosted because of the COVID pandemic or the, the working circumstances, but there are also a lot of folks who have been really negatively impacted. Um, especially parents who are, uh, fa faculty who are parents who are now, I mean, I speak from my own experience. I'm homeschooling a fifth grader and a second grader um, while juggling all of this. I know many of my colleagues are in a similar position or there are folks who are waiting for data. So their data collection has slowed down. Uh, I know our own university scrambled at first about how to handle protection of human subjects during the pandemic. Um, and so a lot of research was completely stopped unless it essentially had to happen. How would you recommend people navigate that either in deciding when to go up or how to put that narrative forward around the amount of time that they've had to dedicate to things or any stops in their trajectory related to unique circumstances around caregiving, around a global pandemic. This also came up for researchers who have been, uh, especially this summer, um, researchers who have been researching things related to um, Black Lives Matter and then were personally impacted um, by the turmoil this summer and the, and the racism. And it makes it very hard to continue on that trajectory. I think um, uh, due to the pandemic, um, I have more time personally uh, working from home. Therefore, I would use this time to prepare myself if I were to come up for a full professor. Now, some may not have that experience because some may have to take care of children and as a result, or their, uh, their, uh, their grandparents or whatever. So it, that, that depends on individuals. But if you had more time working from home, I would suggest that maybe prepare yourself better to uh, for come up for uh, promotion as a full. Uh, Daryl, yes. Yes, um, I, I don't disagree that using the time if you've captured time back is an important attribute, but I'd like to be very candid and those people who know me know that this is not unusual for me, but let's be very clear that the academic complex, the academic industry is not without its own isms. And being in a situation where you are a underrepresented in um, category within higher education, and we, and we know that varies by geography and discipline, but there are, there are very many gaps in, in, in our academies. Um, being absent from your colleagues and being away from the institution is not necessarily a good thing. 
you, you will be characterized as a loner. You will not be seen as a valued player. And there are certain individuals and groups who don't have the luxury of being able to sit quietly and do their work and let the work speak for itself. Um, we know that racism, classism, gender um, isms all play out in higher education. And we are not immune to it at the review ranks of promotion and or tenure. And so part of what I try to do now is to make sure that the committee reviews that I'm willing to do, the, the comments that I give back on recommendations that come to me, incorporate an aggressive agenda towards how, back to the context, how a promotion benefits the collegiate space on multiple fronts. So I, mean, I, I just think in order for us to have this discussion, we have to be honest about the not so friendly space of higher education for all groups. Thank you so much for saying that. We got a big response in, um, in the chat about that as well. People feeling very strongly that, th that there are many, um, many groups that are disproportionately impacted, um, especially around COVID, around caregiving ableism. Yes, Trina, please add. Um, well, I would say from my perspective, from March until now, I've been going nonstop. So meetings of community, meetings on Zoom, meeting with the senior leadership team, trying to get my center going. I mean, it's been, even though I've been at home, my time has been um, completely rearranged in ways that I wouldn't have anticipated. Um, and, and then I also have um, children who are homeschooling, and, I mean, not homeschooling, but working from home virtually. And so having to at least be present occasionally to, to help them out. Um, and so we actually, as a university, are grappling with this. Are we going to try to have some sort of a, um, a statement or some sort of a set of recommendations so that um, this context can at least be acknowledged? I'm not saying we're going to do it well. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. Um, but rather than just, you know, what external viewers might say or not say, what people on the p &T committee might do or might not do. We want to kind of make a statement to say, this is our approach to evaluating, you know, the last two years or however long it's going to end up being um, until we're back to closer to normal. Um, and I think that would be a good thing for any university to do, um, or school of social work in particular, to say, you know, we realize that there are going to be differences by race, by gender, by ethnicity, by family circumstances, by, by disability status. Um, and so, um, we want to kind of put this blanket that from 2020 to 2022 or whatever the case might be, you know, there's going to be some um, special um, recognition of the different circumstances. And not that everyone's going to acknowledge that and, and maybe take it into consideration if they could, but at least, you know, raising that to people's consciousness, because I think it is important to take that in mind that people are differentially impacted. And then, of course, for people who are going up, they'll have to to the best of their ability, if there is a context that has to be brought in to say it, not to make an excuse, but to at least to say what that context is. But other people, please jump in. <laughs> if your schools are doing that as well, I'd like to know. <laughs> Well, uh, another question that's come up um, is how that kind of dovetails again. I keep saying dovetail. I'm going to have to find another word. <laughs> Apologize. It's 9 a.m. here in California. Um, the disproportionate impact on our BIPOC colleagues, particularly around service obligations, which which Daryl already alluded to, but also in terms of um, we, we had a, a comment that came in that said um, sometimes scholarship activity might not necessarily be up to the standards of those typically privileged to have earned full and be in those powerful positions. And it continues to create this disproportionate white supremacist view of the academy. Um, and how, how do you all mentor your colleagues that are trying to seek full around the topic, those, those issues, around the disproportionate impact of, our, of service obligations um, on our BIPOC colleagues? Uh, I want to uh, bring it up is that um, 
in a short time, uh, the standard uh, doesn't change. I serve at the university level. It, 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 it has not changed for a long time. So it stayed the same. So I, I would think about uh, using this time to look at your strengths, po uh, identify the area that you might want to break it up. How do I address the problem due to the COVID to highlight the strengths that you have in addressing this problem during the pandemic? Um, of course, um, the publication uh, being counted as the, one of the tenure uh, promotion uh, uh, criteria, still uh, the service in this area would help reviewers understand or the committee um, recommended for promotion uh, to full professor to look at this real serious, seriously, that you making extra contribution in addition to the regular uh, uh, contribution you have had. John. John, I think you're muted. Sorry, uh, to your question, I think there's two things. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is um, as a full professor and an associate dean, it's incumbent on me and it's responsibility of all my colleagues at that level to make sure our review criteria addresses those issues. Right, so so it's 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 it can't all be on the, the candidate. So that's my, my first point. Uh, this, the second thing is, again, I think you come back to, to storytelling and really sitting down. So when I've mentored faculty of color um, who've, who've kind of had a different trajectory because of circumstances, you sit down and you kind of systematically go through everything that they've done. And all of a sudden you, you really find a very rich story often, you know, that it's, it's they've mentored tons of students and deeply involved in community things and, and so on. And it, it's all a type of impact, right? So, so you're, you're telling a story about the whole context of this person's experience and career. Um, it's not the, you know, in a lot of places, when you go up from assistant to associate, it's, it's almost like this checklist, right? You get so many articles, check, you've got so many committees, check, you know, and, and this is not that this is, this is, you're, you're trying to, to tell a story about a career up to this point, where it's been and where it's going. And the, you can't disentangle the person from the career. Yes, Daryl. Thank you for that, John. I mean, when you conclude it with, you can't tell a story without, um, at, by disentangling the person from his or her career, we, we are who we are, right? I mean, we bring the, the totality of that. And I think that's a very important and compelling component in this discussion on moving forward to full professor. The question for me um, to individuals that I'm working with, whether that's someone finishing a doctoral degree and looking towards higher education as a career path or somebody ready to go up to full, there are two questions I ask. It's assuming that you're successful at this, then what? Because the then what is an important part of the narrative you're telling in why you wanna become a full professor because it speaks to the longevity of the tale that we've been talking about that you're not, you're not a flash in the pan. You're not gonna get full and then um, evaporate into the ether. What people are looking for is that there is a sustained contribution. If you can't articulate that discussion in terms of, well, what happens after I get it? If your only answer is, and I am a full professor, that's a weak narrative. And so I think one should give consideration to what comes next. The other thing I think is important to ask in your setting is whether or not it's a one-shot deal. Is your institution disinclined to permit a second bite at the apple? And if it is, then the stakes are different than if you're in an institution where should you not make it the first time, it's not unusual for an individual to do a, a second attempt at a full professor. That doesn't mean idly or you know, serendipitously take a shot at it. You should be intentional, but I think it's important to know that the history within your institution. Thank you, Don, I saw your hand. Yeah, so I, I had two points. One is, um, 
you know, I think this point around what are your institution's expectations and what do they say in the appointment, promotion, and tenure policy, right? And they should be articulated in some manner what the expectations are for someone to be promoted to full professor, right? And, it, and at different institutions, it's going to involve different capacities. At Ohio State, it's really excellence in research, teaching, and service, right? And, and we clearly articulate in our policy national, international reputation, uh, you know, quality scholarship over a continuity of time. Now, make sure you look at that. And then, and then for the promotion to fall, in, in my perspective, it's, it's kind of like a math, you know, it's, it's like, a, are you there yet, right? Based on the policy, based on the um, documents that are in place at the time of which you're at right now, you have to really sort of investigate and say, do I meet these benchmarks? And if so, yes, right? But, but it is a journey over time and it is sort of a threshold where you have to sort of move forward in terms of um, this, this broader leap into leadership and scholarship and national presence that um, others look to you for guidance for. And those are things you have to build over time. And, and you may have hiccups along the way that get in the way, you know, or that prevent you from getting there as quickly as you might want to. Um, but there is this sort of threshold that your policy and your institution will have that you have to indeed meet. And, and if you don't, right, the full professors inside your institution and external reviewers indeed will provide you feedback that you haven't, right? So, so it, I know it's a challenging game to play. It's kind of like chess, but um, you know, there are these things you have to do and, and there are um, expectations in the academy that differ from institution to institution based on culture and policy. And, and it's really important to start learning those right when you arrive at the institution, right when you get promoted to associate, and then keep thinking about those as you move forward so that you can be on that trajectory, where, which is your ultimate goal anyway. So I hope that wasn't too direct. <laughs> No, and actually, I appreciate the directness, and, and I, I'm going to reciprocate with the social work directness here, um, because I think what I have seen um, this, you, you all have such amazing um, pieces of advice, um, but we have both the question about a gender and the question about um, race. We, we spoke in very vague generalities, um, because those are such tenacious problems in the academy. Um, and so I think that I encourage everybody on this webinar to keep chipping away at that um, because these are very real problems that have created a glass ceiling in the academy for, for many of our, our colleagues. Uh, I saw in the Q&A people were saying, well, my university is going to give an extra year because of COVID. And, and I truly believe I'm here as the voice of the associate professor. That's not a real solution. It's not, it is just delaying the inevitable. It is de delaying people's trajectory. It is delaying people's income and then their retirement. Um, and so time is not a solution, but I think often in the academy, we feel that we have to set a standard that cannot be flexible um, or responsive. Daryl, I saw you had a response to that. Oh, somehow we lost your audio, Daryl. Oh, I'm on a double. I'm on a double mute so that you don't pick up my handwriting and paper shuffling. Um, I was just agreeing with you, Dorian, so much because when the COVID hit, there was such an outcry just to delay the clock, and I had to go to bat many times to help people understand that delaying the clock and starting you a year later where you are now isn't necessarily an intervention that the goal for me was to make sure that those individuals ready to move forward could, could definitely move forward. And that those who ultimately needed more time would have a beneficial intervention as a result of time. So, you know, we talked about institutional engagement. We talk about being a full professor. We talk about being associate deans, administrators, endowed professors. As a provost, then my job was to leverage an intervention that would enable people. And so I moved forward with resources allocated to pedagogical innovation subawards, so that while you couldn't go out and do research, you could get credit for innovating a curricular component 
um, that would ultimately affect your promotion and tenure because innovation, innovating the curriculum, I think we would all agree, is part of one's portfolio on the trajectory. And so it's crucial for administrators not just to go to the knee jerk, time is the solution, time without an active engagement or intervention is actually quite detrimental. And I would go back to the B, um, BIPOC, it could be really detrimental to individuals who don't understand the full context of what's at stake. Patrick. Uh, I would go back, uh, thanks uh, Doro uh, for your early comment about um, the institution uh, regarding uh, promotion to uh, full professor. Some university does not have, uh, do not have the criteria that uh, when you can come up to be promoted as a fool. You can try as many times as you want. For example, in my university, but some probably don't. But on the other hand, if you come up for promotion from assistant to uh, associate, that might be different. You might want to check with the policy at the university. For example, in University of Houston, uh, even though someone who came up early, but once you come up, that become mandatory. You cannot have a second chance. So check with university. But in full professor rank, I uh, promotion to full professor, I believe that most university uh, will allow you to come up uh, many times as you want. So if you are on a marginal, you're not quite sure, well, you can take a chance. I also want to comment due to the pandemic, uh, university are facing budget cut. So when you get promoted, you don't get your uh, salary increase. So uh, is a good time to come up uh, as a promotion without salary increase? Uh, that is something you want, want to consider, okay? So anyway, that's my uh, suggestions. So another question along that same line that um, I know a lot of people were interested in, in hearing your perspective on is that there are some universities who allow you to come up for full multiple times if you don't meet that threshold initially. Um, and that there's really no timeline necessarily. But there are some universities where either formally or informally, the message is if you have been an associate, a long time associate professor, longer than 10 years, it's really not going to be worth your effort to go up because there's a, some sort of um, hidden timeline that you should have met and you've been an associate for too long. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Is that um, in your experience, uh, uh, something that's just whispered in the hallways and not truly real? Is that is there a threshold out there that some universities hold around where how long you can stay as an associate professor before you go to full? So I'd like to kick off there. Um, I would argue, you know, how we talk about, you know, perception is reality. I would say if there is in the ether around the water cooler in the hallways, there's some element of reality to it somewhere. And these individuals might end up on the committee. It's back to what I said, the committees are not neutral and people, even with standards, people are interpreting and applying the standards to their review and ultimately their vote on a promotion package. And so in, you may be able to go up as many times as you want, but I think many of us have seen situations where if somebody goes up annually, you know, not annually, but on a regular basis, at some point people are like, oh, here that one comes again. Um, that's the first thing that greets the application. So I do, I do think one would take that into consideration. And Dorian, I think your articulation of that goes to David Miller's first question about having um, a number of publications and then the gap in terms of going from associate to full. This speaks to that. And, and I think for each of the panelists, I'd love to hear how we, how we think about people coming back after either more than one attempt or some period um, of years between associate and full to be ultimately successful. So, I mean, I have a one that's more gender specific. Um, I have I've had colleagues who have had have been sort of career associates for a while, and a lot of it was due to being a parent, right, and having children at home and and juggling sort of personal and professional responsibilities. And and so there were these gaps, you know, at associate once they got tenure, and then you know, slowed down a little bit when the babies were young and getting into school age, right? And then 
Um, at that point, what they they had done is is gotten back into the academy and the the scholarship and the productivity at the levels you know in which they had done pre you know having this gap and and were able to show consistently over multiple years how they were um, continuing on that line of inquiry and becoming more rich and deep in their studies and and in their scholarship and so. So they, but they couldn't just come back right after having a gap and say, I'm ready to go to full. They came back in and, and then continued to, you know, establish that productivity over multiple years and showcase their national and international leadership in that capacity at that different time. They had to wait a little bit, but because the productivity wasn't the same as what it was before, but they ended up ultimately doing fantastic and had a, a no brainer slam dunk promotion to full um, as they were patient. Other thoughts from the panelists? Yeah. John. Uh, on the, uh, as Daryl mentioned, kind of the, the, the case that comes back, right? I think if, if you find yourself in that situation where you, you go up and you don't get it, um, get as much feedback as possible and take it to heart. Um, that that's what really kind of puts pe sets people apart. Uh, I think from time one to time two, where if you get if you have some criticism, like you need more national, uh, a, a bigger national reputation, let's say. Well, you ask what that means at your institution, right? Um, and then go from there. Um, there's nothing worse than seeing a case come back that looks exactly the same, just three more years of the same thing. And because it's, it's, it's not gonna fly. Right. So, so you really have to, you know, listen to the, the feedback and ask a lot of questions before you come back up. That would be my advice. And John, um, just to add, even before you go up for fall, you know, getting your CV in front of senior faculty and having them look at it before you even, you know, start thinking about it so that they can identify areas of improvement before you even, you know, go through the effort is, it was really, really helpful to me and I know has been helpful to people I've mentored since. Patrick, were you gonna add? Um, yeah, I get a, a suggestion. Uh, is the fact that when uh, you receive your feedback uh, from the external reviewer, as, as many of them probably you don't know who they were, but the committee local department or college may give you feedback. You have a couple of negative recommendations and you might want to withdraw because the negative uh, external review will draw attention from the upper level, from the university level. Uh, for example, we're not just looking for the department, the college, but we're also looking, rely on external reviews. If they are negative, that raise a lot of uh, eyebrows regarding, well, is this justified for a full professor promotion? Uh, and therefore withdrawal would be one option. There's no penalty uh, in most university for withdrawing early, okay? On the other hand is that uh, maybe try next year. You never know because the selection of the external reviewer may be different. Uh, and there is, to me, it's objective, but it's also subjective. So it depends. So if you get more positive review, then I think then you, 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 you're in better shape in terms of promoting as a group. Thank you. Trina, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, most of what was said, I just wanted to reiterate what, um, what um, one of my colleagues said, um, Don, um, that if you talk to the Dean people and the PNT, other senior people and ask for areas that need improvement, people are gonna tell you, right? If you get multiple people to read your statement, and get feedback. You don't have to do what everyone says, but you'll at least get the feedback. Um, um, and then obviously, if you have allies and people who think, you know, who would support you, that's great. But whether you do or not, whatever feedback you get is good feedback. Um, and getting it before you go up as opposed to after, particularly if it's bad, is really just as good. So I would just reiterate that point. Thank you. We've also received a bunch of questions about administrative duties and administrative appointments kind of on both ends of the spectrum. And since we only have about 15 minutes left, I want to um, try to address multiple questions in, at once. Some people are asking, will it be a problem for me going up for full if I've never had any administrative responsibilities in my unit or my university? While others are asking, 
is it even possible to go up to full if you have a heavy administrative load um, as an associate? Uh, so I'm wondering if we can um, hear your perspective on that. Don, I saw you, you nodding your head. So would you mind kicking it off? I mean, it, it's, a, it's such an interesting perspective because I also think a lot of it lies on a senior faculty to not burden juniors and, and associate levels with too much service or too much administrative so that they can focus forward. Um, what I see is that the, for me, in my perspective, perhaps a mistake that some folks do is they take on an associate dean or a director position perhaps too early because of maybe pressure from a dean or some expectation that maybe, you know, they don't really want to do it, but feel like they have to do it. Um, but then what happens is they get put into those admin roles and really have not, it, it puts a big hindrance into their ability to go up to full at the timeline that they would have originally liked to have done. And so, you know, I think for, for people um, as associates, you will be asked, right, to chair committees. You will be asked to take over the BSW program. You will be asked to, um, you know, uh, serve on the Senate of the university. And, and you're going to have to weigh those responsibilities and decisions um, because they will get in your way towards full. And so um, for me personally, what, what I did is, ran to full, right, and, and was promoted pretty early in my career, and then now have the luxury at, as a full professor to continue on my line of inquiry with my scholarship, but then make different kinds of choices around leadership and admin and, and responsibilities. And so no matter what you decide, I think, um, you know, it, it does definitely get in your way if you choose to go into an admin position before promoted to full. Um, and we have a couple um, of people at, at Ohio State right now who are in that exact situation. So it might not be what you want to hear, but I guess that's being honest. <laughs> Patrick. Well, I personally feel that uh, the admin position would help uh, your area of services uh, that you serve at the college or department. Uh, on the other hand, um, being an administrator, um, you might make your college more or department more reputable in their country. So that would become a contribution. Uh, on the other hand, the bottom line is that on top of service and teaching, do you have enough scholarship that will merit the promotion to the full? So I would say being administrator in the meantime, that you have the same uh, scholarship productivity as the criteria required, it, I think is the advantage that you come up for a uh, full professor. Daryl, go ahead. Sure. Um, I, I don't disagree with either of my colleagues. I just have a different um, slant on it from my own experience. And that is, I was going to be expected to do everything anyway. So I took the pathway of why not just do it all. Um, and so I happened to have received a CDC five-year award around the same time I became associate dean. And so I melded those two worlds together where my scholarship was still advancing. And then I had some NIH fund, you know. So for me, if I was gonna, if I have to be all in, I'm gonna be all in in all areas already. And so I think that for some people, it is appropriate. And I just wanna say, you know, back to my earlier comment, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that Dawn had the ability to make that fast push to full. Um, for some people, they're not going to have that responsibility. And one of the things that we're looking at, we mentioned it tangentially before, is economic well-being. And for some people, that administrative draw brings salary. And so I would just say, if you attach the administrative draw because you know it's going to help your, your financial bottom line, do not see that as the only pathway. And as our two other colleagues have said, the scholarship has to go with it. And to use Trina's terminology, I think John used it as well, you must be strategic. And your strategic component means you need to be able to say to your loved ones and family for the next six years, I'm gonna be a beast and you just have to put up with this. I'll, I'll write the paychecks, I'll bring home the money, leave me alone. Um, <coughs> that it's a choice we make. So Daryl, I, I love the all in, I'm gonna be a beast. And, and the expectation is when you are promoted to full professor, you are one, right? And you've established that in multiple areas 
over the course of your career. And, and that's the benchmark, right? And, and uh, so I, I love your Canada. Thank you. So can, when faculty, so that's fantastic. When faculty can be all in and, um, and just put you know, their nose to the grindstone, obviously that would be an ideal world. We know there are things that derail that, right? Caregiving duties, um, university responsibilities, your research blows up on you, whatever that might be. Um, we've had a bunch of questions about how to frame that in your statement, both to external referees, but also internally. So how to address stops and starts. I think Trina started this conversation really well for us talking about how she talked about the trajectory of her research agenda and how that was cumulatively building, even if it wasn't very early on resulting in 100 publications, that there was a build there. But are there other ways that you all would recommend folks address gaps in their profile um, if there was a period of start and stop. Uh, and another question that came in is, how, at what point does it sound like you're making excuses for yourself to an external referee as opposed to being transparent and authentic? Daryl, do you start? Can I just want to say to that question, Dorian, um, I think there's a difference between addressing a gap and a start stop. And a gap, I, in my estimation, a gap meaning that you did not do scholarship, you did not do service, you did not do something else, that's a fatal. You need to fill the gap because you're still held accountable. The question becomes, did my start and stop delay me filling the gap? Because if the gap is there, I, I, I just don't know how you overcome that in, in because the status of full professor is intentionally reserved for people who hit a certain mark. There's nothing wrong with being an associate professor for life. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists have thoughts about the narrative? Yeah, Patrick. Yes, I uh, want to say, um, I saw a question from the chat. Um, can I change topic? Uh, from uh, one to another, and will I be penalized if I change my research topic uh, to become a fool? I say absolutely not. I change my focus uh, anytime uh, because the needs, uh, research needs are different, okay? So in preparing a statement, I think the major issue that is that what are your goals? What are your objectives in your life career? So if you can relate to your research programs, and uh, grant proposals that are addressing your goals and objectives uh, that help the college at the university. I think that would be a more strong argument that you will be a great uh, professor. John. Yeah, I think that is whether to change or not is often driven by your university's culture. Um, I know at USC, they're looking for a very linear kind of trajectory, right? Tight trajectory and how tight it is. You know, if, if, if you're in the bench science world, it's being this study led to that study to let, you know, it's really tight. Um, and they still expect that of us. So, and then there's other places, uh, like earlier in my career, I was at the CSU, uh, San, or California state system it was just productivity, right? It didn't, it, it, it was more of what Patrick said. If there was a need out there and you could show you were addressing some need, but you need to know the context of your own university. Um, especially if you are expected to be an expert, a national or an international expert in a subject area. It's really hard to get there if you keep changing your trajectory. And if you do change, I would, be able to, I'd, I'd want to know why, right? You, you need to be able to say why you went from A to B. Um, and, and sometimes there's a common thread, but I mean, that's just, that's my opinion on that. So in advance of this um, talk, we have about five minutes left. We prepared, the panel that was planning this prepared 15 questions. I've asked you all one of the 15 that we had prepared because we had so much audience participation. But luckily there was some intersectionality between our questions and, and what the audience has been asking. But I think we have a really great 
question to end on. And I'm gonna pose it and ask each of the panelists to respond to this. The question is, can you talk to us about the benefits that you feel have come with achieving full professor that weren't there for you as an associate professor? Um, and I would add to that, that question was about the benefits, but there may also be some added responsibilities you've taken on as a full professor as well. So if you could speak to that too. Trina, could we start with you? I know that you, we want to congratulate you since you're a relatively newer full professor. We're very proud of you. Um, well, I guess since this is the, the last major milestone outside of going to, I guess, university level administration, you kind of have some stability. You know, you've kind of achieved that ultimate milestone. So that is obviously good. Um, the one thing I wasn't expecting is I'm being asked to do a lot. <laughs> I mean, a lot. Um, and so um, and so I have to think through, again, what do I say yes to, what do I say no to? Because I feel like I have the, um, the um, ability to say no occasionally um, it, um, and not necessarily have penalty for that. Um, but also, I'm also thinking about how I can build a team around me. Um, so team of people that I you know, work with in terms of students over time, maybe people that I hire to work with me over time and then do delegation to make sure that I don't have to do it all. Um, and I can think long-term about delegating and building a team and who I'm gonna work with over time because I know I'm gonna be here for a while. And I know some people, depending on the, their circumstances might be with me for a while. So we could think about two or three year plans as opposed to, you know, if I don't get this hurdle or if this doesn't work out, you know, no one's gonna work with me, no one's, and so knowing that you can, you can build some stability, you can build a team, you can plan a little longer time horizon, but still you're gonna be asked to do a lot and the expectations are gonna increase. So figuring out kind of what you are committed to doing, what you have to do and what you can say no to. That's for me, has been a benefit, but also a strategy as I'm now full professor. Thank you so much, Trina. John. So the, the biggest benefit for me is, uh, as a scholar, it allows you to take chances, all right? Um, I had been on a pretty tight trajectory for years using traditional methods. I always had this nagging sense that I needed to be working with computer scientists and engineers. I wasn't going to do that before I became a full professor. Once I became a full, for, a full professor, I had time to take three or four years to develop a new area of knowledge that's related to what I wanted to do. That's the luxury of that. And that's where you, that's where you use that position to advance your field. To the responsibility side, though, that, that does, it does come with responsibility. If we're good full professors, we're trying to protect you all to let you give you time to get up here, um, right? And, and really protect the junior people to get tenure. So it, the, it, there's both, right? And it's just finding that balance. Patrick. Well, I just, uh, uh, we're excited uh, when I uh, became a full professor. Uh, the higher you go, the more work that they gave it to you. I, I want to echo uh, uh, Trina about that. Um, so the, the provost asked me, oh, can you serve on the honorary uh, uh, co uh, committee to select the honorary degrees to be awarded? Can you serve on the expedited review for tenure? from outside people to come in to serve as a tenant uh, for Professor job. Uh, in terms of uh, other things, I feel I'm very satisfied uh, with my job. Uh, the, being a full professor, I feel being recognized and I also feel uh, my job is very important. On the other hand, I want to see that uh, being a full professor, I help to make impact in the community. Um, as a full professor, people invite you to give more talk, your research, and invite you to be uh, participating into research projects. Uh, I also be proud, I uh, really enjoy uh, mentoring associate professor and assistant professor. There's a question about, uh, um, about the role of the full professor in terms of mentoring. So that would be something uh, I am very satisfied. Um, there's another thing is practical. Uh, being a full professor, you get a little bit your salary raised, okay? That helps uh, uh, due to the inflation. You know, in a public university, how how frequent that we uh, get a lot of raise, okay? The only time in my lifetime are two chances. One is promote to associate professor. The other one is promote to the full professor. So you get more raise there. At, at least in my university, I don't know others, but I would expect that other university would do something very similar. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick Donline. 
I think for me, uh, having been uh, promoted to full has has uh, the most the most significant benefit is the use of my voice. So um, I do a lot of work in children and youth mental health and in public education systems. And I think for me, uh, there's a, a very much a moral obligation, a social responsibility that I feel to be able to um, call out some of the um, nuances or uh, you know, idiosyncrasies that are going on in our government or in our political systems or in our social policies and, and say the things that a lot of people can't say, perhaps if they're working in the administration and um, serving at the, you know, pleasure of the governor. Um, you know, and so, so as a full professor and as someone who is in social work and education and also youth development, using my voice and being able to be heard in a way that can really push institutions and say the things that maybe others inside can't say without having the, the risk, you know, of losing my job or losing that grant or losing my family income or instability. Uh, I don't uh, that I'm, I don't have those. And so I feel for me, the biggest benefit has been able to use my voice, my expertise, ask the critical questions that maybe others in the room can't or won't because of um, risk that they might have um, because they don't have full, right? Um, and so, so for me, that's the biggest benefit. And then my social responsibility is using that voice on the best of, for the best of the, the kids that we're serving in Ohio and nationally. And, and so I have to always keep that in mind, um, but I feel like that's the biggest benefit. I can do so much more to address social problems and, and address um, political structures because of my role as a full professor that I wouldn't have the luxury to do or the ability to take the risks if I didn't have that. Um, Thank you, Don. And uh, last but certainly not least, Daryl. All right. And we have a long history, right, Dorian? <laughs> for, for the audience, I, I'm actually having great difficulty referring to Daryl as Daryl because I know him as Dr. Wheeler because he taught one of my foundations of social work practice courses in my MSW program 20 years ago. So. <laughs> All right. So that that's the perfect segue into what being full means for me is that um, similar to what Dawn just said about the voice, it has given me the opportunity to challenge the institutional structures of the academy. I'm specific about the academy that are impediments to people being able to have their voice. People don't have a voice, not by accident, it's often by structure. And as a full professor and as a provost, I get to challenge that in powerful ways using my social justice lens as a social worker. And then, and I think the, the, the complementary piece to that, and I'd like to close on for myself, is that as a full professor, while I have voice, it's important that my voice diminish to make room for the future voices. And so there is an important balance there because I have lived through too many full professors whose voices are so big, they don't leave room for anybody else, even when they have nothing to say. I'm trying to keep it real. <laughs> I, I think we all appreciate that very, very much. And we appreciate your time so much today. Um, this was uh, one of the highest attendance rates of, of any of our SWER um, uh, webinars that we've hosted. And this really is just the beginning. Um, we, Arati and I in the background have been saying perhaps we need to have an, a part two of this panel because there's so much engagement and so much need. Um, so we would like to thank all of our panelists. Um, John, I just want to verify you had the opportunity to say where you benefited from um, the promotion to full, correct? Okay, good. Um, and I don't want to cut anybody off. And um, so thank you so much for your time today. And I hope to see all of you in the near future. Hopefully we can be in person at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.